about moderation and the like, right? Um, agave then will, um, will ask for some kind of relief from pain. Dionysius will say in bitter wise, for bitter was the shame you did me when thieves honored, not my name. The chorus will get the last lines as Agave is then led off to go to banishment and exile. There may be many shapes of mystery, the chorus will say, and many things God makes to be, past hope or fear. In the end, men looked for cometh not. And a path is there where no man thought, so hath it fallen here. In other words, there you, you, you think you understand, but you don't understand. It's a very enigmatic, and it, these are the final words that Euripides ever wrote. We think about those final words of Shakespeare's Tempest, the, uh, you know, by those words of Prospero. We ask, is this, is this real? I mean, how do you interpret a play like this? Like, what do you do with a play like this, right? For example, is Euripides making fun of religion? Or is he the conservative who is saying, you better respect the gods? Or is he saying, no matter what your beliefs are, you better show moderation, right? Because we gotta have that moderation in all things. Well, let's jump to level two and three at level two A. Hey, think about this for a moment. At the Delphi Oracle, we were talking a lot about that, right, through these plays. At the Delphi Oracle, there are three, in fact, Delphic principles that are there on the walls. Two are well-known. The third one, not so well-known. The first one is, of course, we know it from our study of Plato's uh, Apology, know thyself. The second is, nothing to excess is usually the translation, everything in moderation. The third one is less known. A pledge comes from madness. In other words, be careful about the vows that you make because you're going to end up having to keep those vows. Think about how though those all, all three of those work very well in this play. It was Dionysius who told Pentheus, you don't know who you are, and you certainly don't know who I am. The idea of knowing who you are, right? Notice Agave literally does not know who she is because she is all wrapped up in this frenzy, right? Many people have read this Agave um, persona as being somebody who just gets so consumed with something. I mean, think about that one. The last time that you knew somebody was just totally fixated on something. And everything else is just kind of like they're blind to everything else. All they care about is the one thing that's in front of them. Of course, the nothing to excess makes all the sense in the world given this play, right? Everybody's going to excess. Of course, some readers of this play say, well, doesn't Dionysius go to kind of an excess here? I mean, really? Pentheus torn limb from limb by his own mother and his aunts? Are you serious with me? Of course, this whole thing about a pledge coming from madness, well, that one works as well for this one, doesn't it? Because Pentheus made the promise that he was going to make sure that this Dionysian cult would die out. And of course, he wasn't able to keep that vow. He himself was the, the translation out of the Greek is usually the sacrifice, right? Sometimes we even think of him as all the scapegoat back to our comments on, uh, on Oedipus and Oedipus the king. Of course, the most obvious message here is reference for the gods or you will be jacked. Unless you read this play as, come on, this is not the way gods behave. This is clearly not legitimate theology or religion. Come on. Anthropomorphic gods behaving as men or as, as women. It's uh, normal men or normal women. This is silliness. Again, how you, how you decide to, to, to read this play, I'm going to leave that one up to you. Think about this one, though. That's another major message here is this notion of civilization, the Apollonian element versus the natural world of the Dionysian, right? And that tension that, again, Nietzsche was playing with in Birth of Tragedy in that famous essay of the Apollonian Dionysian, right? Of course, we need some of both, but not to an excess, right, of both. At level 2B in the rhetoric, of course, we've got powerful symbols here. Think about it. I mean, there's several of these. Um, how about this one? Dionysius' hair comes to mind. Remember our comments earlier when we were doing Milton's Paradise Lost and we said so much of the action of that, of that epic poem can be plotted by the hair. What's happening to hair? Is it, you know, for example, Eve's hair or Adam's hair? Notice here it's Dionysius' hair. That's the first thing that Pentheus points out as being wrong with Dionysius. And, of course, he ends up putting on, he ends up putting on the wig to look like a woman himself right? Another primary symbol. Think about Pentheus's head. I mean, it's really grotesque that she walks in with that, you know, with that head holding that head uh, by the hair, right? Um, but think about Pentheus's head and the notion of head. That is to say, Athena, she sprang full-blown from Zeus's head versus Dionysius, who comes from Zeus's thigh. Again, the distinction between the head and the heart, passion versus intellect and all of that. 
Another powerful symbol is, of course, the theater itself. I mean, I think this is the most brilliant play about plays. Because there you are, watching a play where the god of the theater, Dionysius, says, do you want to go watch? Do you want to go see? The temptation, right? Do you want to see? Do you want to watch? Do you want to see? It is, of course, the temptation of the serpent in Paradise Lost for Eve. Would you like to taste? You can become as gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, sight equals knowledge, epistemology. You want to see, don't you? Surely you want to see. What is it that brings you to the theater in the first place? Of course, in the process of seeing, things can happen, and you are changed. You can be transformed. You can be affected in some way. Certainly Aristotle thought that that's what the greatest plays did. Of course, we got all kinds of conflicts here, don't we? The skeptic versus the devoted believer. Right? Tiresias and Cadmus is kind of devoted believers versus Pentheus, who's the skeptic, we might say, right? The new ways, Dionysius, versus the old ways, right? Is the new actually better? Or do the new ways ruin the old ways, right? Dionysius is the new in this play. Of course, the question is, well, the conflict. Is the theater good? And, of course, the conflict, do you want to see? It's one of those things Stephen King once said in a famous essay about why his horror works, because he said people drive by a wreck and, uh, and the ambulances and everything. They know they don't want to look, but they do want to look, and look they do. We have that same kind of voyeurism that's occurring in this play, don't we? And even though that terrible action of that scene was not actually on stage, because the messenger tells it in such graphic language, it's here, right? It's, it's, it's in the mind. Let's jump to 3a and how we relate this to other texts. Think about all of the other tragedies. They all seem to be saying the same thing, this respect for the gods and the importance of humility and the idea that if you don't have humility, the gods have a way of payback, which is brutal. Notice that it begins with the Oresteia in Aeschylus in, the, in our conversation with those plays, but this, the last of the great Greek plays, it, it ends even more horrifically, right? Uh, again, we've already said this, uh, St. Augustine was acutely aware of all of the different kinds of resonances that become relationships to Christian theology, and Augustine would have to answer that, and, and I'll let you kind of do your own study, and you certainly did it, and he did it brilliantly, but he has to answer that. Oh, so your Christ is born a, a, of Mary, a virgin. Oh, kind of like Dionysius, in other words. So Christ is kind of like uh, like Dionysius. I get it, I get it. The mystery cults. Okay, right, 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 where you kind of, you tear bodies apart, and you eat the blood and drink the wine, and, all, and drink the blood and eat the body and all that. I get it. And, and St. Augustine has to answer that. And he says, no, 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 no. Christian theology is something far more profound than that. Well, I'll let you do your own research on how he does that. Think about Shakespeare, right? Of all the scenes in Shakespeare, probably the most disturbing is that from Lear, right? King Lear in Act 3, Scene 7, when you'll remember that Cornwall will actually tear out the eyes of Gloucester, out vile jelly, and throw them down onto the stage and stomp on top of them. You can obviously make your, uh, you know, your, your relationship to this text, right? What is for you the most violent text you know? And how does this text compare to that text? I've had students that say, man, this is some pretty violent stuff. I mean, if you were to turn this play into a movie and you actually showed that scene, that would be a really, really disturbing scene to see, especially because Pentheus is begging his mother to recognize him as his son, and she can't do it, right? All right, well, we said at level 3B, we're always trying to relate text to ourselves. So let's just ask some few questions here. What is, for you, the most disturbing thing about this play? Okay? Some students will see it as the scene where Pentheus gets torn to shreds or Agave walks in with his son, with her son's head holding it by the hair. Other students will, in fact, see the more disturbing element of this play is the suggestion that if you make fun of the gods and you don't believe in the gods, something terrible might happen to you. Finally, you get to make the decision. What do you think that Euripides is saying in this, in this play? Is he saying, respect Dionysius and the gods? Is he making fun of anybody that would believe in this kind of craziness? Like a god I asks, this is not the way God should behave. Or is in fact this play for you one about the Delphic Oracle of moderation? Not, nothing to excess, right? Nothing should go too far. Even the best of experiences should not be taken too far, right? Of course, an obvious question is, a time that someone did something in your 
wife, either you personally or somebody you know, out of extreme passion or maybe a crazy state of mind. Maybe it was drug-induced, maybe alcohol-induced, where they did something totally insane. We're familiar with stories, right, about guys who get so stoned or so drunk, and they do something really terrible, even murder. And then when they come to, much like Agave coming to with the help of Cadmus, they go, wait, what happened, what happened? And they did not realize. They were out of their mind, quite literally, right? Finally, let's ask this question. Why, in our lives, is moderation so hard? Why is that? Um, on LearnStrong.net, of course, we have those lectures that I've given on the Unstoppable book by Craig Conrad. He asks this question and tries to answer it a number of times, how he gives examples of young people who were unable to show moderation. They started with one beer, drank way, way too many, and then ended up doing something terrible like running into a bunch of people and killing a bunch of people. And when Craig Conrad catches up with a student like that who has gone through that experience, all that student can say is basically the message of this play. You've got to be careful with drink. You've got to be careful with drugs. You've got to be careful. Moderation or don't do it at all because it's so dangerous, right? The Dionysian element. Well, we come to the end of our study of Greek tragedy with this play. I mean, there never really was an, a, a great play to our knowledge of Greek, a Greek tragedy after this one. This one is in many ways, some call it the death of tragedy and drama. I don't, know how you, I don't know how you go beyond this. Of course, we could argue that there's this long silence between Euripides as the Bacchae, and then, of course, we think maybe about Shakespeare, 1600, and, uh, and, and Hamlet, uh, and the great tragedies of, 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 of Elizabethan drama, right? But we're not done yet. Um, in the volume number eight, we have one more text. There's one more writer. There are the three great writers of tragedy, but there is also the great comic writer. Now, we know that the Greeks enjoyed their comedy, and we have the great writer Aristophanes. Now, it's always going to have been a debate, I'm sure, for um, Charles Eliot to decide as he was collecting texts for his volumes, which of the plays of Aristophanes will we do? You would assume he would do a, a text called The Clouds, where he makes fun of Socrates. And in fact, Socrates, in the Apology of Plato, Socrates alludes to the fact that there's a comic poet, he's talking, of course, about Aristophanes, that made fun of me. But that's not the text that Eliot decided to include here. Rather, it was a text called The Frogs, which, are you ready for this, has nothing to do with frogs. The question of the text is, who's the better writer, the better playwright, the, the better tradition, Aeschylus of the Oresteia or Euripides of the Bacchae? And of course, I'll leave you with that question as well. Which one of these two texts are, uh, do you, do you uh, buy? I'm, I'm happy you hung with me through this one. It was, all, it was a tough one, right?